Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this afternoon's plenary. My name's Heather Richardson. I'm one of the chief executives at St. Christopher's Hospice, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Scott Murray this afternoon. Sorry, Scott. Um, he's Professor in Primary Palliative Care, and um, he comes with a really interesting portfolio. He's a part-time GP as well as an academic, and he's got an extraordinary portfolio of interests uh, beside that. I've been reading Scott's work for a long, long time. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with him more recently on a number of projects, and I can say uh, without doubt he's unfailingly supportive of hospice care extraordinarily generous in sharing his knowledge and his expertise, and most importantly, a very thoughtful, objective, and indeed a very kind, uh, critical friend. I'm sure we won't be disappointed this afternoon uh, when we listen to him, so without further delay, music maestro, let's dance. That was the Dance Macabre. Do anyone know who's, who it's by? Sansong. Sansong, that's the one. Or Jonathan Creek, I think it's on that show. Some of us know by. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Thank you for the very interesting topic, Dance Macabre. It's a funny phrase. Some people don't know it, eh, the Dance Macabre. So in the old days, there was a lot of death around, and people knew a bit about it, OK? La Dance des hommes et des femmes, okay? People understood a bit about it. There were even books about how to die well. And this is before health-promoting palliative care. There's someone, you see, there's a skeleton, so it's, you know, there we go. That might be a Scottish one, <laughs> with the bagpipes, okay? Dance macabre, it was in the community. People learned how to die well. In fact, good living, good dying was part of a continuum. Maybe that's a slightly more modern version. Strictly Come Dancing might go somewhere here, but maybe not on this one. But what I want to suggest today is that uh, there's different ways of dying. Everyone doesn't die the same way. And in the past, Joanne, Lynn, and I have been considering different typical trajectories of physical decline at the end of life, so we can really forecast what is happening. So there's the cancer one, most people would know, and then the, which is the blue one, and it comes down like that. There's an organ failure, one in the middle there, and there's a frailty, either cognitive or physical. So, think of a dance that might represent the cancer one. What would you choose? Quite quick, something that people knew, a bit predictable. I'm Scottish, so it has to be the gay gods. A bit more volume, please. Take your partners, please, for the gay gardens, okay? So it's well organised, isn't it? You're even shown how to do it, and you finish it, and it's done like that, okay? So in some ways, that could mimic, if you want that trajectory, and people, there's common knowledge about it. We know how to do dying of cancer quite well in the community. So the challenge is the next one. What dance would possibly go along with this funny trajectory? What do you think? What am I choosing? It's the tango. Hear a bit of tango. Do many of you know how to tango? Hands up. Yes. Some of you would admit to it. I won't get you up here to show us how. But you know, not so many of us know about it. There's lots of ups and downs and a bit irregular, and I'm totally hopeless at that type of thing. And there may be some parallels in knowledge about that illness trajectory of the up and downs. And the last one. Okay. Last waltz. It's got to be... Uh, on, on a sexist comment, all the blokes are skeletons and the women are glamours. And it's very hard to get it the other way around. 
So here we are from Fojac. So that's the best I could find. You may be dancing with your beloved. That's what you like to do, yeah? Although he may not be there, yeah? You might trip, yeah? All the people trip a lot, yeah? Or you might forget the steps. But that's the type of story. That's what I'm trying to say. They're different dancing, yeah? And what type of dance halls do you guys provide in the hospices might be a question. So there's an academic bit now in the middle, okay? So this actually pulls on some work, a paper that we published in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management. And what we did is that we actually dance into different tunes, living and dying with these different aspects. So the aim of this paper was to establish whether there are archetypal different experiences and different patterns of decline, the acute, the fluctuating, the graduating, and really to propose any relevant redesign of services. And we weren't just interested in the physical trajectory because we all know dying is at least a four-dimensional activity. So going back to this, we, that is the, the physical decline that we've seen before. There are many, that, that's a mapping of a multimorbidity a physical trajectory that we're starting to experiment with. It would be like that. There were other trajectories. There was one in the BMJ recently. This is people who have stroke. And so I'm just saying the idea of trajectories, we know it's things go up and down. So if you speak to a stroke physician, they say a third of my patients die. They die in hospital. And two thirds survive. Half of them are disabled. Or half of them are fine. But you know, they, they don't, they say they survive. They don't die. But of course, these people, I, and in fact, we're doing a research study in Edinburgh just now, recruiting people with massive strokes, getting out of hospital, and looking to see what shape of palliative care approach might be suitable. Because geriatricians sometimes don't do the dying bit, though they're very good at uh, going ahead with rehab. Maybe some geriatricians here. But, um, the main thing. But, so, so the methods of the study, we took uh, serial interview studies, we had eight longitudinal studies, studies carried out by people in the team at Edinburgh over the last 10 years. Three were in cancer, three were in organ failure, as you can see, and one in frail people with South African participants. And there was one in um, frailty as well. The interview scripts have all been analyzed previously with the support. And these are the methods we used, and we published them in the BMJ to try to say, actually, Serial longitudinal research is a really good way to understand experience of people at the end of life. And these previous papers had been published, mostly in the, the BMJ, the Canadian Medical Journal. In, in other words, generous literature, because our message is to get out and let people understand what we're trying to do there. And so, so you can see there's a big load of work. So I'm trying to say there's a bit of an evidence base. There is evidence. This is as good as your quantitative evidence that these are how people feel towards the end of life. So we analyzed it based on the three phases of the narrative. We found that there were sort of um, first stage and then the becoming ill, living with advanced illness, and dying. And these were three stages that we quite often f heard. And the researcher from each study used the framework to review their own data. So the researcher was still around there. So we could actually bring not only the data, but the people who had gathered it. And it's really good in quality research to go back to these very people. And so we analyzed these data using different dimensions. So that would be the classic four dimensions that we, we talk about in palliative care. Initially by the illness trajectory and then compared the three phases of the narrative. So quite a large data set for qualitative research. And that's so you can see who were there. And many of these people, of course, two thirds of everyone we're talking about here have multimorbidity. The different types of multimorbidity. In Glasgow, multimorbidity is young people with massive heart attacks and stuff. Eh? In Edinburgh, slightly different, for older people with that. So even multimorbidity is an, an interesting issue. So what are the results? Well, with cancer, this, at the beginning, am I going to die was a question. Diagnosis were often rapid, rapid or sometimes distressingly slow. You can just see up here what we're doing. People confronted with the possibility of dying. It's a life-threatening illness. In the middle of it, people moving into this cancer world of treatment and diagnosis, managing treatments and managing the side effects and the burden of all that. Sometimes dual narratives, just, yeah, encompassing hope, but a realistic one also that they may well die. Competing themes going on there. And at the end, dying was inevitable to this group of people. Struggling, and that, that at the end, triggered an input from palliative care. Normally, in, in Edinburgh, it's actually seven weeks before dying in this group, as a study in primary care showed. So 
and these are just some of the, 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 the quotations to show that. Just give you a minute to look at that. Not me for six, oh God. Yeah, I'm going to die. Middle, there was honesty sometimes. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with me. Okay, trying to get back to the new normal in the middle session. Main thing is how am I going to live? Sort of, and some existential issues as well. So we mapped these and uh, with, in these studies and previous stuff, and we found that people who are actually uh, dying of a cancer or around that acute trajectory, they have a physical decline, okay? And they, they actually, their social decline tends to go in parallel with that because they don't get out, folk don't visit. But we discovered that there were four classic times when there was a lot of anxiety and existential, existential issues. So at diagnosis, even around diagnosis, coming to diagnosis, when we interviewed people at the time, that was a really important time to support people who are anxious, who have existential issues. Now, can we get support at that very time? The answer is no. A lot of the support often resides at the very end. Yet, these are times when I can predict. I say, things will get better. You go into hospital, you get support, you get treated. Come back and see me because you may be anxious. So we can foretell this, which is helpful. It helps people understand where they're at, what happens to most people, their carers, and it can help us plan treatment. So that seems to be a typology of the other dimensions. And this is the same. We also interviewed family carers. So you wouldn't be surprised that while the patient themselves has that decline, the family carer is going through another helter-skelter of emotions. So they do decline. A, a, they do, do decline health-wise, physically, but they again have these times. And again, this allows us to realize, and this would validate why early palliative care, the Temel model, might well work, because it's actually helping people at this stage. And surely, as palliative people, care people want to help at this stage, not just in the last seven weeks of life, as per usual. So organ failure, let's go to see what's happening there then. You can see at the beginning, patients often held different views. What's happening here? Especially in Africa, we finished a study, you know, heart failure, uh, absolutely no idea what it is. It's just in these, these, you know, it's TB, no, it's HIV, no, well, what is it? So there's a, it's a, we know a lot more about in Britain. Many people struggle to find when their illness started or making some connection between the acute episodes and their condition. Okay, you're feeling a lot better, they're better. Okay, there's the middle. And the frustration and the isolation and the hopelessness, I can't do what I used to do which is really an existential issue, which can be very upsetting to people, sometimes the main issue. In Britain, we know that these existential issues, in fact, are, or are, especially in cancer, are more important than pain in, in primary care. And a few, very few concerned about dying, okay? A lot of these people have survived a heart attack, so they're survivors, yeah? They're not thinking of that. Few concerned about dying, and it described previous exacerbations, so that sort of should reassure them things are gonna be fine. I'll just pause a minute for one or two quotations there. Don't know when it started. Uh, it was the third, especially in liver failure. Liver is the worst organ failure for uncertainty of prognosis, yeah? The one with the greatest comorbidity and the least of palliative care supported. So we really should help. And it was great. I hear someone is doing some innovative work in liver failure in the abstract. It, so there we go. It's one day on top of the other organ failure. We're paddling downstairs to, to, downstream to Niagara. Eh? That same GP, all I am is a blood leech and a monitor. Totally disempowered, didn't know what was happening, felt terrible. But of course, with these trajectories in the back of your mind, you can sort of be in control of it. I know it won't get better, but I hope it doesn't get worse, okay? As long as the thing keeps working the way, I'll be quite happy. So there's something from organ failure. And that is a, a, a suggested uh, trajectory that we published a week while ago. And you can see that while, the, while these people have a physical decline, it's also, it's quite anxious if you're breathless, I believe. Makes sense, doesn't it? So if we're trying to prevent admissions to hospital, we should be up front and help people deal with anxiety when they have these acute exacerbations. Deal with possibly social problems as well. So if you're trying to either prevent or support people in these acute exacerbations, these multi-dimensional trajectories allow you that actually there's a lot more going on. It's not just physical. It's not just good out of our service that does A, B, and C. It's about so support. Maybe having a number to phone. We aren't quite sure about where the spiritual trajectory is here, but it does go up and down, and that's why we said that. Frailty, then. This isn't the real me. 
I was at a geriatric conference last week, and you know, it was a the hot topic, the biggest subject in, in medicine just now in, Ab in Edinburgh is what? It's frailty. And they were saying, you must identify people who are frail so we can support them more. Reminds me a wee bit of me talking about identifying people for our palliative approach and supporting them more. So there's another group out there doing something. We surely must be doing something with them. And there's other people trying to prevent admissions to hospital with other interventions. And we're all possibly doing in silos, so we'll have to watch out for that. Anyway, frailty is big in geriatrics. And these are some of the narratives. Sorry, I'll just go on here. Oh, due to an accident, didn't really understand it. I haven't got an answer for it, neither have I. Gradual deterioration. Some people could adapt very well. You know, I, I used to play tennis, but now I just watch Andy Murray on the television, okay? So retaining that interest as much as they could, and others didn't. So that's a putative uh, multi-dimensional trajectory for frail people. You won't have seen these before, because it's the first time we've stuck them up. And it's the outcome of a PhD that Anna Lloyd uh, recently finished. So we had interviewed frail people using a social definition of frailty for three years. And it was interesting, we found that I'll just uh, push this on so we know what's existential. I should be maybe asking you. But we found actually, one, there was, we interviewed five people over that time. A third of them actually were like this. They were very stable. The people were very resilient, working fine, and they lived and continue to live. And then there was another group where we saw, while this was still going on, there was a, a dip in this worry or the existential issues. You know, I was, ah, I'm worried about going to the care home or losing my marbles. And these worries that the old people have got. And sometimes existential issues. And then there was a, the third people were more like at the end here, where, where they were actually being unstable and weren't just coping, but going down there. And to, to, to cut a long story short, the implications for primary care are for us is, yes, we should check up that physically they're okay, check their physical things. But if we're trying to support people, we should support them socially and support psychologically and considering all these dimensions. So that just shows that even in, in this group, there are various things going on. And I'd, I'd be interested in comments on this or, or your own experience if, if this maps in well. So um, if you then look at a, a, cro a, a graph of these things, the cancer was usually sudden, busy with treatment, hospice and palliative care involved. That's the only one, that's the only box where the hospice and palliative care is involved. Organ failure, no clear event. Uncertainty, being exa li trying to live normally with limitations. Keeping going, hospice and palliative care, limited uh, and late. Often no clear event, frailty is a gradual decline. Sometimes people were normalizing and adapting. These are the fears, as, as we know, yeah. If, is palliative care meant to be patient-centered? I think it is, isn't it, yeah? Frail old people, what are their main fears? Is it dying? Do you ever go to an old buddy and say, oh, I'm, I'm awful scared of dying? No, they tend to be a bit scared of these things, yeah? Do you agree? So if we are gonna have patient-centered palliative care, what does that mean? What do we talk about? What do we talk about preventing, dying again? Or do we do with these things at least first? Okay, so we'll go to the next one. Aha, the place of death in all this then, okay? Yeah, I'll put it in red here. So with cancer, death's a real threat at the beginning. It's backstage with occasional appearances, okay? And then towards the end, it may be center stage, palliative care usually pre present, as I said, it's the only box here. Organ failure, rarely considered. Brushes with death during exacerbations, but I've survived them, so usually feeling okay. And then keeping going, and there's limited input from this group here. They might die, but they might, might not, so no why discuss it. Frailty is up here. Death isn't a concern. Worries about fate's worse than death, as we've listed. And a slow or rapid final decline, eh, depending on cases. Of death will happen in due course. I'm not, not saying it's not going to come. We'll maybe discuss it once. We've got a care plan. But we don't have to talk about it every time we come. It's culturally dependent, and this is a grave in, in Kenya when I was out there. So someone's under there, and that's the toilet at the back of the room there. But of course, the different issue. In Kenya, the main issue of dying is, is lack of pain control, lack of morphine. So this is culture. I just flagged that in, and we should think of other cultures. OK, so what does this mean? We have identified quali good qualitative evidence accepted by journalists that actually there are different experiences going on. 
patients with progressive cancer follow a predictable, well, you see what I'm saying there? Open acceptance about dying facilitated hospice and palliative care involvement in cancer often but late. Not for everyone, in fact, some, most cancer patients in Midlothian, in fact, my wife is a, a GP, very supportive in this area, the practice itself dealt with more, most people, and I don't think they were deprived too much, so it does depend a lot. Not everyone wanted to disco, okay, so not everyone wanted maybe that type of service. Patients with organ failure and frailty were less aware of the causes and the progression, and they often shared different views to health professionals less coherent stories. You know, there, there wasn't the good narratives in these other illnesses going out here. So we conclude that uh, most people die. Is that okay? It was normal. Dying is normal. All patients want support to avoid crisis and enable them to manage ongoing restrictions. Dealing, you know, the, dealing with uncertainty. Because a lot of us try to think, well, I, can't, I don't know what to do. I don't know the prognosis. Let me, let me just check out till the prognosis is clear. If we don't know the prognosis, they might die any time. Therefore, we have to make a plan. So dealing with prognostic uncertainty, we have to realize it's implicit and will be till we all die. And we have to deal with that uncertainty. And we have to teach people how do we do that. You guys could probably do it. GPs aren't so good. I, we did some training on how do you deal with this uncertainty. And they all went back to breaking bad, breaking bad news, which is actually a different type of consultation. So um, that's where we are just now. So we studied and published Three years ago, in Lothian, most of you will know this, this graph, I hope, where at diagnosis of a condition, whether it be organ failure, this is an organ failure, that we should consider a, not only disease-modifying treatment, but increasingly a palliative approach. Do you, ascribe, do, you, do you understand that slide? So what's actually happening? So we reviewed an after-death analysis of people in 10 practices who had died, and we found out that only with organ failure, only 19% were on the GP palliative care register. And on average, if they were, they were diagnosed, they were put on the register at 13 weeks. And for specialist palliative care, you can see at death, that was the number who had brushed with specialist palliative care. And if they'd been sent, that was where they are. So in this trajectory, there's, there's quite a, a gap in the middle, isn't there? Mm -hmm. We don't really know. Now with organ failure, it might be that I'm not saying this is going to be six years that we should go back. But surely if we know this trajectory lasts for two or three years, people can die at any time, we should be starting a lot later. And that's, what, that's three years ago, again, in practices throughout Lothian, that's the one for people who died with frailty and dementia on that trajectory. And you can see there were 20% here, and it was very, it's desperately late for this approach. Look at this. This is, this is not good. And, uh, well, what is happening here? That's the issue. Some people may be giving a palliative care approach, so I'm saying it's not happening, but we don't know it's happening. It's not being sort of reliably done. So this is a study we did last year in Scotland, and you may be able to see there's, there's a pink thing that's now starting to deal with this white space. Because for the last three years in Scotland, general practice has been encouraged throughout Scotland to actually do something called anticipatory care. We just use that word because it's different from a care planning. And so it's encouraged, all practices are encouraged to identify people who are, whether it be at risk of hospital admission, that's really how it got funded, to identify them and to start a participatory care plan, an electronic key information summary. And all the software was in 100% of the practices in Scotland, whether it's vision or EMIS. So that facilitated the start of this anticipatory care. So you can see the situation last year in, in Scotland is that not so in frailty, some more actually are dying on the register, and it's a little earlier, but still late. This is in frailty dementia. But most people dying with all illnesses actually are actually receiving anticipatory care, which is holistic care and planning ahead. It includes DNAR. It includes preferred place of care. It doesn't include anticipatory medicines. So it sounds like palliative care, doesn't it? But it became very popular. And so one reason why it might have become popular, I think, is that we didn't have to use the palliative word, you know, with our patients. Yeah? We said, no, I want to let out of hours know about you, okay? Can I send them a key information summary? Of course, I thought you'd do that anyway, okay? 
And that triggers anticipatory care, and that triggers a key information summary. And, and one thing we're blessed with in Scotland, we've got the software, so that's actually happening. And I would believe throughout Scotland, there's an outbreak of anticipatory care. Now, I actually was funded uh, for this project by, by Marie Curie, a well-known charity, yeah? And uh, so actually, we did very well in the project, in, in this study, but in fact, you can see, we didn't actually do very well in things called palliative care, but we did very well, I think, with anticipatory care. So there's maybe something to learn about how we can sell our, our, our brand. Do we have to use the P word? Some GPs don't think no. But with the recent LCP debacle, some GPs said, oh, we have to use the palliative care word, otherwise it'll be like the LCP will be accused of giving them palliative care without letting them know. So there's an issue about vocabulary. And I'm going to go ahead, I think, next year to try to press on with anticipatory care. That's just the details. So it actually works with the different trajectories. It helps a bit of this. I must say that this, there's a gap here, just so I can show them. There's a great increase, more than double increase in here, say. But there's still a bit of work to be done in actually starting earlier. So that's anticipatory care. And I have data as to when, if they were done, if a DNA was done, it was an average here, for instance. When, when, so I actually, as a part of a, a quality indicator of what's actually happening here, we can actually know when on average it was done. So that's something about uh, that. So how do we then identify people? What's cred how do we actually I identify them? And there's a tool called the Supportive and Palliative Care Indicator Tool, whereby we can actually look at, a, which is a list, it looks like that here. And it's, it's actually, it's, it's, there's now an app in Scotland where GPs can use this to actually identify from their lists uh, how they can, um, people who, should be screened for a palliative support. And this is Kirsty Boyd, who I work with. This, this is being actually very popular now. It's, it's, it's downloaded a thousand times uh, every month at least, and it's been translated into quite a few languages. But it's just a way of possibly diagnosing people with all types of illnesses. So you're looking at indicators of decline. Yeah, it could be they're in bed all the time, whatever. And then checking it off with uh, a diagnosis or multimorbidity. Liver disease, okay. Admission due to ascites, okay, has to be an indication for a palliative approach. So there's, there's some things like that. Also, so there's, there's, there we are, that's a specific. So we're starting to try to influence the liver. This is the largest educator in liver disease in the States, and they asked us to actually look at a, what a good death would be in liver disease. So I'm saying that some of these specialists are getting into this area, and we should support them with it. And we look in heart disease, so we've got, we've got a trial just now, of palliative care and heart disease. And what we're, before we finish that one, here's heart wanting us to actually say, how do you do it? So it's very hard to, that, so you can give a best evidence, but there's more work has to be done still to sort it out for heart. And I mentioned the computerized search criteria where we can actually identify people. I'll mention one that's interesting to you. In, in GPs, have you heard of the, the quaff? The quaff? Yeah. It's a bad, none of us really like it. But to, to get adequate funding, what we do is actually, if someone is ill and might die, why bother with a statin, okay? So if you look at people accepted from a quaff, for whatever reason, a really rich place of people who might well get this benefit from palliative care approach. So there are cunning ways of identifying people, because that's the big stenosis in the pipeline. And that's just what it looks like That's a, a, in our... That's, our uh, GP practice, we're starting that electronic kiss, and we've got all these things here, and then we have the special note, which is the care plan. And if someone's sent out of ours or is an acute admitting ward, we're trying to, still struggling with hospital doctors to make sure that they read this, because this can be accessed in hospital. Out of ours are good at it, but we need this through, all very well having anticipatory care in, plan, in general practice, but we need it actually throughout. Okay, there's a great, I mean, what is our oyster? We should surely be helping people eh, overseas as well. And there is, how do you integrate palliative care in ongoing work in Kenya? And so we, we, we recently went to four countries to integrate with money from FET, uh, a British charity, to try to integrate palliative care in the different settings, in hospital wards. Most people in the hospital ward in Africa actually are palliative, according to us. And how do we deal? How can it be dealt with? Training at one nurse in the ward, maybe, will help and deal with two thirds of the people there and refer others to maybe a team. So through this, there's big issues. Whatever we are doing here really needs to be thinking about international aspects. And this is a year where we're changing from Millennium Development Goals to 
SDGs, different type of goal, okay? And, and, and palliative care was not mentioned in the MDGs at all, but it is around in these new goals. And we are now, we are publicizing that last study in Africa into looking at to the United Nations to say, palliative care actually, if, it gets, if we get this right, we can do a lot of other things right. We need, so there's, there's a great opportunity for the palliative care approach actually to, to, to inform a lot of countries, in fact, as it's been done. So again, it's how did we do it? It was early into intervention hospital and communities. Develop and documented referral pathways. I mean, patient notes don't exist very much in other little hospitals. And morphine wasn't available in half of the 12 hospitals we chose, and by the end, it was available in most of these hospitals. So that was a really good project to try to get palliative care integrated into normal health services in Africa, because the hospice model doesn't work at centres of excellence. So this is, and we had 60 people actually, journalists from the UK and some specialists out as mentors in this project. I'll just press on. Um, so there's a, a, a Kenyan hospital, and you can see, do you see palliative care there? It has arrived. Now that's not actually not necessarily good, because it might be a wee clinic around the back, but the point I'm making here in this hospital the, it was integrated in all the wards. There was someone there that they'd had training. The nurse in charge, because there's only one nurse in the ward, knew about palliative care and knew what was available and the prescription of morphine. Okay, I've rattled through. How's our time going, Helen? It's okay. So um, now the bit to think a wee bit. Dancing with death. I'm back on there. So we've talked about this slide in the pants in the past. Sorry, Charlie Ledbet, this just one about how do we innovate? And we can innovate inside our hospices or in our hospitals by quality improvement, or we could actually be a bit disruptive, do something new, you know, have a special clinic. And the other way of redesign is to do some sustaining innovation outside. So you might do something, you might send specialist nurses to care homes. That could be an outside to, to support the staff there and train them. And then this is this totally outside disruptive thing might be something like health promoting palliative care, work with volunteers, things like that. So it's a good way of thinking, you know, what's my hospice? Are we doing something sort of in each of these boxes? So I don't want you to reflect a little bit on the, on the dancing, on the, how we can help people who are doing different dances eh, live well. So possible hospice outpatient clinics. So here, here's a, a throwaway idea to encourage GPs to refer people to hospices. So for instance, if you had an, 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 on a Monday a clinic sort of focusing on cancer or chest disease, like GPs don't refer to hospice, many people with COPD generally, maybe you've got good practice, because well, what can they do? Okay, that the GP might, maybe don't know. It's not about, so we can say, if you go up to this clinic, maybe there'll be one run, there'll be the chest disease specialist, and there'll also be a palliative care person, and they could then have a joint clinic like that. And so I, I know there are actually, some of you are doing this already, but you could then think of these different conditions, multimorbidity, dementia, there are other ones, it could be children. You know, you, you could think of how can we extend within to do something, and this of course would have lots of uh, possibly support because they'd be joint, the, the hospital doctors might learn a bit by coming about palliative care, and vice versa. So, uh, so I, one idea would be to consider local professionals, how they could be involved as a specialist doctor and, and a specialist nurse. So a heart failure nurse for a multidisciplinary clinic. So that's actually getting someone to the clinic. Or you could go outreach into these hospitals, okay, where there's a lot of palliative care to help there and go early. And as I hinted, GPs are motivated. It's much easier for them to refer patients to have this sort of assessment of disease modifying plus palliative approach. I would, I would go for that one. And, and that way, rather than saying, well, GPs will never refer these things, we have to make it good for patients so that, and, and GPs as well. So this is one sort of idea. And we can maybe, some of you will just say what you've been doing as, when I finish. For the clinics focus, so we can talk about carers. You could do something in cultural groups. It could be specific on pain or a third sector, so that you could have a, a day where other people are coming, so there's that multidisciplinary movement going on. With frailty or dementia, how could you help in this, this group? Well, supporting care homes even more. A lot of good work I've been hearing about at this conference, but really, we, we could surely help them more. Supporting every uh, general practice, maybe to a, uh, 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 I don't know how many of you go and maybe do a, a call. Does every practice 
in your catchment areas in the hospitals, they benefit from care and support visits, maybe every month or so. New models of care home medicine. Okay, so in, in Holland, there are people, there are GPs trained in general practice and geriatrics. That's their specialty. Okay, they're not one or the other. And they look after people. So there's that model that is uh, being looked at. Community involvement is a large subject, but again, the support and just being with someone can be very, very useful. Community, not only actually fundraising, whatever, but befriending and supporting people. And we've heard a lot about care circles, which can be very helpful. Something you might not have heard about is a care, a care home innovation center for development, training and research. One of my colleagues, Joe Hockley, who has an OB, I think, for a palliative care nursing, has, is passionate that we should start a teaching nursing home, or a, we're calling it now a center for innovative development, training and research. This could do for care homes, possibly what hospices did. You know, the hospice movement started 50 years ago. Yeah, so it's a place that will be good. there will be teaching undergraduate, postgraduate of folk. It could really do. So we're trying to, that, that would be an out of the box innovation, as well as, as well as, of course, supporting care homes. So we are looking for funding to start one in, in Scotland just now. All the academics are on board, social workers on board. We just have to, and with their next build. So, back to the dancing theme to finish. Strict evaluation of the intervention. And the thought is sometimes people are scared of doing something because it means, oh, I've set it up, we can't stop it. So I'm suggesting when we do these things, maybe say we'll do something for a year or two years and evaluate it. Because unless we're evaluating it quite well, this person did quite well, yeah. We don't really know it's the best. It may be very good, but is it, is it the thing that we should be doing? Okay, place of death is a proxy for quality. A lot of... Uh, People saying, watch out for this one. And in fact, we wrote a, a letter in the BMJ last weekend about this, that we should be improving the quality of care, not only in practices, but wherever people are, because they travel between different places. So it makes sense that we have to help it everywhere. So on the dancing theme, yeah, the experience of the dance from the start to finish is probably more important than where we are on the stage when we dance. And I asked Helen to have a dance with me, actually, but we're not going to do that now, you'd be pleased to know. But the point of this one is, <laughs> the point of this one is, you know, the experience of, of the last phase of life is a lot longer and passes through a lot of settings, Heather, than actually the place. So whether I die here or die there, maybe not so important. Yeah, it's, it's the trajectory. Is that, is that what makes sense? The last phase of life, whenever that starts. Rabbi Burns talked about nay teeth, nay hearing, stuff like this. Uh -huh. We're trying to help people at that time. And the quality should be improved in all settings. So that skips from the different settings. Nearly there. Relationships. Dancing by yourself isn't much fun for those that do that. Some people do that. They don't get them. Yeah. Yeah. Dancing in couples is, is normal, you could say. But some dances in groups of six or eight, they can be quite fun. That's the care circles going out there. I think you've got some ways to strip the willows of stuff. Some dances are progressive, and we meet everyone in the community. So that was just another thought on the sort of dancing theme there. So, strictly come dancing. Mm -hmm. There are lots of different dances that are taught there. Yeah, do, you, do any of you watch it? My wife watches it, so sometimes I listen to it. Yeah, it's quite fun. So what, di what type of dance is that? Charlton? Okay, could be. We'll, we'll take it as a Charlton. Pardon? Okay. Still haven't got it. There you go. Ah. Oh. Roomba. Could it be the Roomba? If, you, if you've got a Roomba, I mean, imagine dying of a, with a sort of Roomba trajectory. Yeah? <laughs> and everyone's got different dances. I mean, you know, if I were to illustrate this again with Helen, you know, we'd be doing our own little steps. But Carol is a favorite of mine. You know Carol, the news lady? Weather, isn't she? She did quite well, but she was put out last weekend. Wasn't it sad? Yeah. She's a lovely person, smiling, but she was put out there. And so she seemed to enjoy it. And she, she, she said, I'm so thankful for all the teaching. I thought that was nice. I was trying to work out if that ties in with here. So I've finished. That's my case. Let's innovate and evaluate.
I just go back across. Sorry? I go back across. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Okay, we've got some time now for some questions, some comments. I know that Scott's interested to hear as much from you as he is to answer any questions that you have. So um, I think we've not got, have we got roving mics as well? We've also got mics one and two, so if you feel like coming down, that could be faster. Uh, who would like to start? Hi. Um one of the things that I think we often do in palliative care is we, we deliver holistic services. So we have a range of services which are delivered in a package under the control of us as a hospice or an individual organisation. Mm -hmm. What you're describing kind of is quite disruptive in that it suggests that we maybe need to deconstruct some of those packages to enable people to access the bits that they might need and not the bits that they don't. Yep. Is there, are there any models that you've seen, or is, mm. it, is that what you're suggesting, that actually maybe we need to be less holistic and more open? Is that the dis sort of disruption you're suggesting? Thank you. I wouldn't say be less holistic. I think we should maintain the holism, but there are a group of people who are dying who get a, a lot of resources. And I'm saying, and they die well, so what can we learn from the care we're giving for these people and take it to other folk? Now, I'm not saying we have to deconstruct, but if it means actually deconstructing, maybe it's a thing we should do. You know, if we've got a set asset in your hospice and we're, not, we're somehow getting this non-malignant people and the government is saying we should, be, you know, we should be doing this, we have to think, how can we actually rise to that occasion? Because it's very hard to make change. You know, ask GP practices to change. Oh, no, we're not doing it, you know? But it may be the same that the, the, within hospices. There may be things happening just now. I was speaking with him. Things may be happening. But uh, basically, so we may have to deconstruct and be careful. But hopefully we can learn and, and transform that way. Hi. Sarah Locker from St Catherine's Hospice at Scarborough. Um, we have set up a care homes education service. And that was from looking at Joe Hockley's work. And that's been really successful. Um, and now we're starting to have discussions around whether we could support people with frailty, um, how we would do that. And it's, um, my question really is around how we support professionals, palliative care professionals, who feel that that's not really their kind of field, that's not what they trained in. How can we, how can we do that? Is it possible? That's a good Thank question you. because these professionals will have been doing a great job in helping a lot of people to live and die well. And to suggest that maybe they should do something different. It must be very threatening, even existentially, for us all, isn't it? But there is a, a public health, the old public health aspect of palliative care, you know, numbers, equity, things like that. We have to move into that area, you know, care according to, not diagnosis, but according to need, and not even according to prognosis. So we have to get going with the, the old public health approach and the new one, which is the, the volunteers and stuff like that. Yep. Um, one of the things we've done at St Gemma's is that we've been reached into a care home and had four beds commissioned in a care home. And that's been quite interesting. So I'm just relating to the previous question because some of us, our CNS, which is involved with that, feels a little de-skilled because she's not using her expert skill set. Mm -hmm. But what we're seeing is a ripple of activity and a raise of the whole calibre of quality across the whole of the care home. And GPs have commented on that. And the patient feedback has been amazing, um, just seeing their experience. But just thinking, we, we can't bring everybody into hospice. We've got to think of new ways of, of caring for people out there and equipping the generalists to be able to do that. Yes, I would agree. I mean, there are three times more care home beds than there are hospital beds. And that's the area that more and more people are dying into, supporting that in care homes, yeah, by introducing routine care planning on admission, yes. Talking yeah. to staff to train them that it's okay to die there and doing something to I identify the end of life are really important. Yeah. Jan? Um, Jan Noble from St Christopher's Hospice. Um, over the last year, in, or two years now, in Bromley, we really tried to address the issue, issue of frailty. We've got the highest number of people in London who are the older population. And we designed a sort of new service taking really every referral from GPs, um, particularly look, not looking at symptom burden, but really looking at people in the last year of life. So we've had 80% of our patients have got non-malignancy um, and really it's all about care planning, advanced care planning and actually finding out what the patient wants and what we've found is we've managed to keep 
of our population dying at home. Um, and really the CCG wanted to partner with this because our hospital death rate locally was incredibly high. So we've not got it quite right. Uh, we need a bit of medicine, certainly. We need some social work. But we're trying to develop a sort of more cost-effective model to address the inequalities in dying. And do these patients know they're getting palliative care? Absolutely. We've changed our name twice. It started as um, Bromley Care Partnership, looking at working with the local uh, yep. primary care service. And then people didn't like that name because they felt they weren't getting St Christopher's. So we're now St Christopher's Care Coordination. Um, and we just sort of describe ourselves as under the umbrella, but offering a slightly different service to people in your situation. So yep. they've embraced the hospice brand. <laughs> but it's a slightly different level of service. That is good, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, some discussion amongst colleagues. Yes. Is it good enough? So uh, the anticipatory care plans that we do up north, they, they start early. And at a certain stage when we think someone is palliative, they then do an extra tab. So that becomes, so, so there's an easy way into palliative care. But what's fascinating is 30% of patients referred to us die within seven days. So it's very hard, I think, for GPs to do that anticipatory care planning for some. Yes, yes, that's great. Thank you. Barbara. Uh, Barbara Gale, Chief Executive, Nicholas Hospice Care, Rosa Heaven. Um, surely the only way we're going to move into that white area is using volunteers in the community and having skilled community members who can be supporting people wherever they are in, in homes, in care homes, um, and skilling them up about those holistic issues and supporting people and families. I totally agree that we should look for that type of input into the, into the centre, yes, because there's a big pyramid in the new WHA guidelines on palliative care coming out, it's a huge, the volunteers are half of the pyramid, and then there's generalists, and then there's hospice, you know, there's people at the top. Volunteers are really important, this health promoting palliative care, and there's some great projects going on, I know in London and in the, in the Strathcarran. My name's Andrew Thorne from Pilgrim's Hospice in Kent, and Scott, thank you, it's always so entertaining to listen to your presentations. I'm glad you're sort of keeping a, a, a lid on all these things that are happening. Um, we've got very um, engaging respiratory physicians near us, so we get a lot of respiratory referrals. Yep. We're trying to look at whether an, a, a sort of a planned admission to the hospice for quite intensive symptom control is broad as sense is helping, and we're evaluating that. But I, I would go back to Sam's point that whilst it would be lovely to have some models that people are using, we have to be very cautious that we, we build up our evidence base at the same time and don't engage models that seem a good idea, but don't get evaluated to make sure mm. that mm. we know they do work. Because a lot of palliative care was built on that sort of idea mm. already. Yes, I agree that I'm, I'm, trying, I'm talking St. Columbus, you know, where we are, to try to start these clinics in the afternoons, you know, to share as a, as a model of a embracing, say, you know, people with COPD or chest illness. Sam, you're so, allowed so, one last. Just sorry, I will stop talking, I promise. Mm. Um, I, I guess, just building on that, that last um, point, really, um, I am a bit embarrassed, actually, because I, I wonder if I can describe what the... We talked about holistic care, and you talked about hol holism. Can we actually describe the holistic needs of a patient with frailty in the same way as a sector that we can describe the holistic needs of a patient with cancer, or increasingly heart failure or COPD? Because I think if the research body of research or work is there that allows us to describe those needs, I think it would probably be much easier for us as a sector to understand how we can use our agility as a sector to meet those needs. I think it's just because we can't describe them in a way that's hospice specific. Um, it seems to belong to a whole lot of services that are out there um, and not necessarily for hospices to, mm -hmm. to utilise our resources. I just wondered what your thoughts on that one. I think that's a very helpful comment and that's why the, the nurse the, who was doing the PhD in frailty and interviewing these people, we said, how shall we analyse the data? And then we agreed that we would use the classic palliative things, okay? And, and therefore, that's why we're trying to talk vocabulary that uh, we would hope mm -hmm. that palliative care specialists can do, and that these data, and there are, there's a lot of information that we've still to publish, I'm sorry, that's just the PhD, that would say this is research evidence, and we'll have to fine-tune the trajectory, but I think that would allow us to talk. Just like if you're trying to get into cardiologists, I've used the GSF, which you know about, together with, you know, the Bristol, the one that cardiologists do. So we're on, I, they identify people in different ways. So we do both at the same time, and we say, yes, that's, that's what's happening. 
There is a call out for research uh, at the moment from Marie Curie, and I think one of the themes is around the nature of dying for people with conditions other than mm. cancer. Mm. Uh, just, yeah. yes, in, yes, indeed. I just remember there's a lot of work in frailty. I'm so conscious that you know, frailty is the new geriatric thing, and so there will be nurses who, who diagnose frailty and they support people, and we might not know about it. So we have to make sure of what's happening in these other sectors, so we are not a, a silo there. But we must get out and about early as well. Yeah, so it's all diagnosis, but how to get early, what should trigger? You know? Are we going to come away from the hospices and start at diagnosis of lung cancer or whatever and spend some time in that clinic and do a TEMO? Because we need a TEMO study in the UK, but the intervention has to be generous palliative care. So. Alan Barron, Chief Exec at Wigan and Lee Hospice. I just thought I would say that we are just about to launch a new service called Hospice in Your Care Home which is mm. very much based on the St. Christopher model. So I thank Heather for uh, allowing us to come down and see the team. Uh, we put a business case together to our CCG. And I have to say, I think it was a very good business case, but I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> but both the CCG and the, the thing that really pleased me was that it was commissioned by the joint commissioning board of the council and the CCG working together because they both saw the benefits of it because we could justify, we could show in this evidence that we've gathered from hospital admissions that by rolling this out across nursing homes across our borough, we would save something like half a million pounds for the health economy. So mm. it's a win-win really mm. for everyone. But I would say that it is important to put a really good case together and to build up the statutory support for it because I don't think we would we will probably gain the same element of voluntary support from it because we are one step removed from the person that is actually benefiting from the service mm -hmm. in going in there. And I think one of the things I've noticed from the small team that we put together, which is a fantastic team which starts work in two weeks' time, is that why I know it will work is because many of them have worked in nursing homes before and they can talk on a, you know, on a similar basis to the people that work there, as healthcare yeah. professionals and nurses. So mm -hmm. we're really interested and really think it's going to go, go places. Thanks to St Christopher's, but um, I'm sure there's a paper in it somewhere and probably yeah. we'll be up on the stage sometime talking about it. Absolutely. That's great, yes. I mean, hospitals, some hospitals have specialist beds in them. Is that right? And other hospitals don't. Like in Edinburgh Royal, you know, the team is integrated. In Dundee, they've just launched new palliative care beds. You know, advantages and disadvantages of both models. We don't, is there a better one? Hi, sorry, my name's Sally Mercer, I work at St Christopher's, sorry, we've just heard loads about St Christopher's, it's not an advert, I promise. Um, so I was really happy to hear about existential and um, family support being mentioned so much, I work in the social work team, and I think that that's one area where hospices can really help, because we see so many people, so many families coming to us at such a late stage, and they haven't been supported with things like... Uh, lasting powers of attorney or anything like that and these become forms that we talk about mm. but actually the impact emotionally for a family even if your relative has been in decline and is becoming increasingly frail if we could support and actually Christopher's we did a lot of training with local authority generalist social workers um, but trying to ensure that families are supported early on means that as a specialist service later on, we're, we're not shoring up all of those problems that are so complex at a stage of life mm. yep. and there simply aren't the internal resources within a family to cope with it. And I really hope that that's where hospices reach out more. I, I know it's about funding and of course we can use volunteers, but I think some well-placed outreach mm. posts where we can support GPs, support other people in the community who are meeting families, letting them know how you can plan for death yep. in a sort of wider, almost Buddhist sense that you're aware of it from an earlier stage could be so helpful for everybody in the sector and the whole of society, really. Yes, I hear that. So you're outreaching and supporting and getting to know people and them getting to know you as well. And then maybe in your hospices, what does that mean? It's maybe having a session for, you know, send someone here if you want to get the care plan sorted out, you know, where people go up from that. Would you mind uh, thanking Scott uh, first? Thank you.